uh, with regards to uh, what we see as a third generation of supply chain planning solutions. And then we'll give an overview. Uh, Mohammed will provide us with an overview of the CELO's autonomous supply chain products and a demonstration of those products. And as I mentioned, Doug will provide us with a uh, overview of what uh, sort of uh, returns customers are seeing from the use of our products. And uh, then we'll have uh, Gordon Foles, uh, one of our AIM partners in our ecosystem, talk about uh, what experience he's had in working with his customers in the CELO's products. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for uh, question and answer. And as we go through the presentation today, I encourage you to put your questions out on um, the chat box and then we'll uh, collect all of those and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. And if we can't get to some of those, we'll follow up with those on an email. Um, but due to the number of people that we have in the uh, presentation opening up for uh, people to ask individually is going to be difficult so we'll just do it through the chat window so as i mentioned i wanted to uh, provide kind of an overview of the three generations of um, solutions for uh, supply chain management if we look back at the history of supply chain planning systems we see that there were three specific advances in the evolution of system technologies uh, the first started in the 1980s with enterprise resource planning software initially erp was facilitating and automating transactional business processes like inventory control and planning functionality through a materials requirement planning system on a transactional level, ERP was a great advance for businesses. However, planning was never the sole focus of ERP. This changed with the next generation of supply chain planning software. And uh, we want to talk about the, the second generation of supply chain management systems um, on the next slide. Uh, the uh, focus specifically on supply chain planning uh, if we could move to the next slide, was referred to as an advanced planning system or APS, which gained momentum about 20 years ago with the goals of facilitating a forward view of the business, integrating plans with other functions to automate and optimize supply chain measures like forecast accuracy and inventory management. After 20 years, advanced planning systems are now in the maturity stage of their product life cycle and are being made obsolete uh, because of the velocity, uncertainty, and complexity that is required to manage supply chains of today. This has dri driven the management of supply chain with APS tools, what we see as beyond human capacity. Mohammed, um, can you elaborate in more detail about uh, the problems that organizations are seeing with current planning systems? Oh, absolutely, Jim. So um, if you think of um, the process of managing a complex supply chain, um, typically, uh, the operators and the supply chain leadership um, usually uh, run a strategic planning process, business planning processes, in order for them to determine where the business is heading. But then they move on uh, to uh, run day-to-day -day, uh, planning and uh, monthly planning, quarterly planning. Usually, um, the coarser granularity is under the sales and operations planning and uh, the final granularity is under the MRP, DRP, uh, the material requirements planning when it comes to manufacturing and so on, and uh, the DRP, the distribution requirements planning of finished goods. And then eventually uh, you move on to execution. Now, the, if you think of uh, the current APS systems, one of the major problems that is manifesting itself loud and clear is that uh, given the velocity of the supply chain and the complexity, uh, managing the supply chains based on forecasts is becoming beyond human capacity. So the idea of having a planner that is putting together forecasts, regardless of what time granularity that we are talking about, and regardless of uh, what technology that you are using when it comes to putting forecasts. So here, whether we are talking monthly forecasts or daily forecasts or weekly forecasts, whether we are talking uh, trivial forecasts that are based on Excel sheets, or more advanced forecasts that are based on the likes of demand sensing and uh, demand-driven MRP, DDMRP, all of these um, don't change the fact that you can never be accurate enough when it comes to putting together forecasts, especially when we are talking about huge supply chains where the number of uh, SKUs, the number of unique products in the supply chain is in the, ranging, in the range of uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions. And obviously, even after you are putting together the forecasts and you are feeding them to uh, the MRP, DRP engines, um, comes 
another challenge, which is uh, another big one, which is in the form of inventory planning. So the whole idea of managing the supply chain based on rule-based systems that uh, find their roots in operations research, driven optimization, uh, and that are in the form of uh, managing gazillions of uh, parameters, uh, min, max inventory levels for every SKU in every single warehouse. It's just insane. You can't do this anymore because simply if you are following just a simple example, if you have uh, 10,000 items um, uh, and you are managing uh, two parameters per item per location, so here we are talking about 20,000 location, 20,000 parameters per location. Let's say you have 10 locations. So 10 warehouses slash distribution centers. We are here talking about 200,000 uh, parameters. And obviously the numbers may run, may run into millions fairly quickly. That's why if you think about it, uh, current demand planning and inventory planning need a complete overhaul. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, even when I've worked with some of my uh, customers out there and we've uh, looked at implementing some of these APS solutions, they have uh, said, you know, we talk about all the results that they'll get out of it. Um, and then they look at it and they say, well, who can manage all that stuff? So uh, I have a firsthand appreciation of that. In terms of um, uh, the impact of not being able to, you know, really effectively manage all that, what are some of the problems that organizations are seeing as a result of that? Well, if you think about it, Jim, uh, the problem with the supply chain is that it's tightly coupled with the performance of enterprises. So here we are talking about direct impact uh, from a negative standpoint, obviously, either on the PNL or on the balance sheet. So problems like overstock, stocking more than what you need, would directly mean tied up capital and would mean extra carrying costs that would reflect into your operating costs. Um, and we'd go straight into the bottom line. Uh, stockouts would mean that you are running out of things that customer would need. So which means a negative impact on uh, the top line. Um, so your sales and you are losing opportunities. Um, excessive cross warehouse movements because you get things wrong at the very first place uh, regarding what quantity do you need to store and keep at any point in time from every product in every warehouse and you just keep moving things around. So that um, ramps up and uh, exceeds substantially the number of warehouse movements. Um, so moving uh, items across different warehouses, which means extra logistics costs. And obviously, um, whenever applicable for some of the industries such as healthcare and the likes, where um, uh, the items would have some lifetime and um, being able to figure out um, the right uh, quantities to keep to store from every item um, is mandatory for you to actually stop expirations or uh, stop being hurt from a financial standpoint because items are running out of food. Yeah, Ma, that 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 uh, really makes sense. And I'm sure a lot of people on the call today, you know, experience some of this, and they're looking at ways to uh, address these problems. Can you tell us how uh, Celos addresses these issues? Absolutely, Jim. So what we have done at Silos, um, given that we are a vertical AI company, uh, we are we did uh, uh, put together the world's first autonomous requirements planning engine, or what we call the ARP. Now the ARP is built on um, the most advanced reinforcement learning, a type of deep learning, and the whole idea of the ARP is that it's a layer of smartness that sits on top of the ARP that is capable of leveraging a cross supply chain visibility um, and that is capable of autonomously running the supply chain, at least the procurement and the inventory processes without the need for separately generated forecasts and without the need for managing inventory planning parameters that are tedious and that are um, uh, very complex to manage. So uh, it may sound too good to be true, but this is exactly what we have done. In the very beginning of our uh, uh, journey with the supply chain automation, some customers uh, were thinking that this is too good to be true. But let me tell you more, Jim, about how this actually runs and how this technology uh, operates on a day in day out. Think of this uh, API, uh, which is our autonomous procurement and inventory planning engine, 
um, which is the core um, uh, machine learning, reinforcement learning engine for uh, our ARP. And our ARP, by the way, is called the Supply Chain Automation Suite uh, SCAS. So, um, uh, so ABNI uh, sits on top of the ERP and it's playing a chess-like game with the supply chain. So uh, here is how. First of all, uh, ABNI is leveraging cross supply chain visibility. So it's understanding the past and current data about demand and inventory and supply. So the most uh, three important angles of the supply chain. Additionally, it knows all the constraints of the supply chain. So it knows um, the logistics constraints, the capacity constraints, and all forms of constraints. So lead time, SLAs with customers, and so on. And these constraints, as you could tell, may be the result of uh, other processes um, uh, that are coarser and like optimization processes that may, uh, may be run separately by the customer. But the idea here is API starts with um, learning the behavior of its opponent and its opponent here being the supply chain. So that just like game works uh, in the following way. Uh, the API supply chain behavior learning step uh, is taken by API before engaging in the game or in other words, before running in production. And what API is doing here is that rather than trying to forecast the future of the supply chain based on a handful of scenarios. It's actually putting together hundreds of millions of potential scenarios that could be taken by the supply chain. And a scenario here is a um, uh, granular combination of demand and inventory of, and supply. Or in other words, it's a state that could be taken by the supply chain. So to illustrate this further, think of a very simple supply chain um, of one product and one warehouse and one angle of operation, which is demand. And here we are looking into uh, the demand of the supply chain and we are trying to forecast the future. So um, we are looking into the past demand and then we are lying to, uh, trying to forecast the future demand of the supply chain. So the idea here is in a forecasting mechanism, you would be looking at this and then you will, you will be trying to, uh, to see what will happen in the future. But in our case here, um, learning the behavior of the supply chain. And I will try to give an analogy for this. Think of fitting a distribution. Now, this is an analogy. This is not what actually is uh, done with the reinforcement learning, but at least it's an analogy that will get the whole idea closer to the minds of the audience. Um, so think of um, running a uh, distribution fitting process where we try to understand the values in the past and where did these values range? What was the range of these values? And based on that, so here, for example, we're putting together a normal distribution of mu and sigma. And um, um, based on that, some like the engine would be tossing coins to try to figure out what can happen in the future. So uh, uh, here, for example, looking at this and the number of occurrences of demand values in the past, we will be putting together different sets and each set would represent a potential scenario that can happen in the future. And we will put together millions of these sets. Each of these sets um, would be treated separately by API or by the engine. And what API would try to do is to look at each set separately and equally important. So it's not that I'm favoring this set or API is favoring this set over that one. And API would try to beat this set. So each one at a time, API would be trying to figure out when to issue replenishment orders, at what time, and what quantity, and um, what product, and in some cases, once, what supplier as well. So um, the resulting um, uh, process here uh, would be that you put, you put together what we call the API model that is trained to beat each set separately. Now that API model would be used in production, now we will be engaging in the game with the supply chain. And that game would start with the flow of day-to-day -day getting the information from the supply chain and then leveraging that AI model to put together um, what type of actions that need to be taken by the supply chain um, uh, or to beat the supply chain. And here the actions would be in the form of autonomous planned orders, replenishment orders, and cross-warehouse movement. So API 
would generate these autonomously and would be pushing them for execution by the ERP. So the result here would be that at any point in time, API is having a current model, and it's one model reflecting the whole supply chain end to end. API is autonomously generating planned orders and cross warehouse movements to be the supply chain based on the current situation. How would that sound, Jim? Yeah, that's fantastic. So it really gives everyone kind of an appreciation on the day to day processes of how you can do without. Uh, uh, planning and forecasting at the inventory and just letting uh, the ARP take over this and uh, issue the uh, replenishment orders that go out and, and telling you where the uh, inventory needs to be located. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, this kind of makes a lot of sense, but you know, especially with today with COVID-19, we see there's a lot of external events. How does ARP deal with these external events, Mohammed? Well, if you think about it, the whole world right now is talking about COVID and COVID has taken the world by a storm. But COVID is a manifestation of a macro scale event uh, with a huge impact on the supply chain. Um, so uh, uh, what we have done for this, for this uh, engine is that it's flexible enough to capture external events. So in the normal case, external events like weather, for example, or oil prices. Um, market uh, changes on an ongoing basis. And API would factor in these external events um, and would take them as uh, optimization goals uh, or would try to correlate them uh, with the current situation of the supply chain from a demand inventory and supply and would actually try to deal with these events um, based on their occurrence. So in an event like COVID, API uh, would empower customers and would empower the players that are running the engine to A, deal with uh, the situation in a much quicker way. Why? Because recall these hundreds of millions of scenarios, many of them were totally off. So in, some, in, in, ca in a case here where like, for example, your actual uh, demand values were here, well, we are uh, naturally, uh, uh, capable of capturing fluctuations because we put together initially um, examples uh, or scenarios that are very odd, that uh, would be totally off um, in the normal cases. And that's why for a macro scale event such as COVID, for example, API uh, would have manifested two types of, uh, of uh, benefits on the ground. A, being capable of uh, managing the event in the very beginning in a much uh, quicker way than any other traditional system. But B, which is even more important, being able to quickly adapt um, in order for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, the engine to continuously manage uh, the situation. And that's because, uh, recall these hundreds of millions of uh, scenarios? Well, uh, the engine would retrain every now and then, so I'm talking here every few days, um, to actually uh, regenerate these hundreds of millions of potential scenarios. So in, if, if, for example, the demand here, suddenly the demand is being 50 or being 250, the engine would autonomously understand this and would quickly retrain itself to actually um, produce another set of, uh, uh, of uh, scenarios and another consequent AI model to be able to cope with the new situation. And this is how uh, the engine would deal with day-to-day -day fluctuations, but at the same time would deal with uh, mega events such as COVID. And obviously uh, this is how also the system would be capable of incorporating extra data sets um, that are not in the ERP as of today. That's great, Mohammed. I've been in the technology world for a while. I don't want to say how long, but uh, maybe covering all these generations. And as the new technologies have come along, um, I would always talk about you know the wow factor, and this certainly is a wow factor. So that's incredible. I think the audience can now see how impressive these tools really are, and what a huge impact it can have on managing a complex supply chain. So I wanted, uh, I was wondering if you could go in and uh, show us a demonstration of the product. 
Well, before that, uh, uh, it would really oh, make yeah, sense to understand uh, the, uh, the actual solutions um, that are covered uh, by this, uh, supply, chain, by this uh, supply chain automation engine. So, uh, Dim, based on your experience, what are the types of uh, supply chains that uh, this engine would cover? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So for MRO and organizations like utilities, water, power and gas, airlines, refineries, steel mills and other heavy equipment uh, type organizations, this is a great solution to manage the MRO uh, materials and uh, um, uh, products uh, with raw materials companies like manufacturers with both supplied and produced inventory for distributors and wholesale retail and manufacturers and in the aftermarket for OEMs and third-party product providers. And what we're seeing more and more of now is in e-commerce with reverse logistics and handling all types of returns with restocking, refurbishment, and reuse. Um, Mohammed, I know we have many customers that have seen great results. Can you tell us about some of these customers and the industries where we have uh, seen the, mo uh, the most traction? Absolutely, Jim. So Celos uh, has been active in the supply chain space uh, since 2017. And... Uh, uh, the way that we have tackled uh, the market is that uh, we've uh, developed and nurtured hubs for uh, the company. Uh, so in addition to uh, being active in North America, uh, we are also active in Asia Pacific region and we are active in the Middle East as well. Um, we have been from day one uh, tapping into uh, large partnerships with um, uh, mega customers, so customers that are managing uh, huge supply chains. So um, uh, we started on the healthcare side, and this is where we partnered with governments and uh, particularly ministries of health for uh, governments uh, in Asia Pacific, for example. And um, this is where uh, we demonstrated the early spark for, uh, for this system. But then we moved on to cover additional types of verticals, such as food manufacturing, for example. And then we moved on to uh, also cover asset intensive industries. So uh, you did talk about MRO, think about um, oil and gas players, for example, uh, that are uh, managing um, uh, SKUs that are usually catalogs, usually are million plus when it comes to their sizes. In addition to that, uh, utilities players that are managing a very intensive uh, and asset intensive uh, operation. So uh, think of uh, power generation plants and uh, water generation plants and so on. Um, finally, um, uh, we did lately embark into uh, the supply chain transformation journey for defense as well. And, um, and this is where governments see a big value when it comes to MRO. Um, and that's in addition to uh, um, a um, strong penetration on the retail side and um, on the distribution supply chains, talk about retail and wholesale distribution and so on with a um, uh, few of the mega uh, uh, CPGs globally. Wow, I can really see where this has got uh, broad applicability. So with all that we've talked about regarding what CELOS can do, and I'm sure the audience is now eager to see the, the system, do you mind walking through a demonstration of the products? Absolutely, let's dive into that together. So. Um, 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 let me start by showing you uh, the system and uh, the process that I will be following today is that um, I will be uh, walking you through the distribution uh, uh, use case because obviously, as you could tell, uh, distribution is the core uh, of any supply chain. If, I mean, if you think about it, distribution is a, the type of a supply chain where the input is the same as the output. Um, and to start as a disclaimer, we are not sharing here any uh, real customer data. Uh, because we are so keen on the privacy of our customers. But at the same time, we are showing a demo um, that is mimicking actual results that we have uh, achieved with customers from a proportional standpoint. So um, the example that I will be walking you through today, Jim, uh, is the example of a petrochemicals player. Um, so they are a manufacturer and a yep. distributor. Um, uh, and they are, in, um, uh, they are uh, uh, headquartered in Oklahoma. And um, um, we are going to start right now with showing um, the results of API on their distribution network. So um, the distribution uh, network for this player is uh, composed of one large DC that is servicing 266 sites or 200 and uh, 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 like actually uh, 270 uh, something sites. Uh, the system was just filtered, so I will uh, 
I, I will show you the big picture first and then I will filter. Um, so 275 sites and 362 62 products. Um, also, as um, a bit of an information um, on um, the, the different types of uh, dashboards that I will show right now, all of these dashboards are the tip of the iceberg that sit on top of our proprietary big data engine and um, uh, AI, big, big data stack and AI engine. Uh, and these are the CELOS proprietary uh, solutions. Um, these solutions also uh, run um, um, on any cloud. We have a preference for Google Cloud, but we are totally agnostic. We can run on any cloud. Um, and also they can leverage any analytics solution on top. So um, uh, this system is leveraging um, uh, uh, Google Data Studio as an analytics solution, but um, um, we can totally, uh, we can be uh, interchanging this with any other solutions such as Tableau and Looker and so on. Finally, uh, to be mentioned that we can also run this system on private clouds and on-prems. So the system is totally flexible in that sense. Now, uh, enough of an explanation at a high level. Uh, let's dig into the details. So what I'm showing right now is a network analyzer. And the network analyzer is our form of a control tower. If you think about it, this is our mini control tower. And uh, that is a network analyzer for the distribution uh, portion or the distribution angle of this customer. And uh, it's showing uh, the different angles of the supply chain, starting with the warehouses and the customers and the suppliers. So if you think of it, uh, this is, um, there is one uh, uh, mega distribution center that is doing 3.3 billion in revenue in 2019. And, um, and um, that did procure, procure items uh, from the manufacturing arm uh, that are worth $1.8 billion. And the COGS are the cost of goods sold is $1.76 billion. So you have a turnover of 7.9 and you have day sales of inventory or days of inventory uh, of 46. And the system is capable of uh, giving you um, uh, the, the dump or the visibility onto the customers. What is it that they are ordering? What is it that's being delivered to them um, and the products um, and the suppliers in depth, right? And usually this is uh, the system that um, uh, we put together whenever we are starting the implementation with any customer. And the idea here is um, that we run what we call a discovery phase first to understand the customer's supply chain and how they are running their processes day in, day out. And then we populate that system using our proprietary integrations with uh, the ERP engines in order for us to make sure that um, we are completely grasping the ins and outs of the supply chain before even running our engine. So um, uh, once we are done with this and once we are uh, signed off with this, then we move on to uh, actually implementing API, which uh, would replace the logic of um, uh, optimization from a procurement and inventory management. So uh, what I'll be showing you right now is uh, API for the top six products in this uh, network. And um, uh, worth mentioning is that when we are to implement API Gym, we go usually take the customer through a journey. And that's usually a crawl, walk, run journey. The crawl uh, step of this journey is in the form of retroactively running API against the current system for a past period. So let's say um, we are here pulling the data from the customer since um, the start of usage of ERP. And then we are um, um, stopping ourselves uh, from a learning standpoint all the way till end of 2018. So we are putting together the AI model or running the supply chain behavioral learning till end of 2018. And then starting January, like January 1st, 2019, uh, we are now in 2020, but that, was a that is kind of a retroactive study. Uh, what we do here is we do two things. We completely blindside ourselves from uh, the actual moves uh, that have been taken by the current system. And um, we receive the demand day in, day out, as it did happen in reality. And we demonstrate to the customer um, in one to three months, or what we call the diagnostic phase, um, we demonstrate to the customer how would API have had a much superior performance to the current system had it been running in that period of the past. Now, while doing that, we are imposing the worst case constraints on API. So we are kind of penalizing API um, going through the worst case um, um, lead times, the worst case capacity constraints, and so on. 
So uh, with that said, um, what I'm showing you right now is um, the top line here is showing the top KPIs representing the uh, performance of the current system. Um, and the second line is showing the performance of API. And the third line is showing the actual change. And um, this is showing the inventory value. And, and here we are showing uh, from June all the way to the end of 2019, because we usually leave the first period um, as a transient period. And here, the, um, the lead time happened to be ranging from two to four months. So we are leaving the first period of the year as a transient period since the current system used to re receive uh, orders that have been put by the end of 2018. So um, if you look at the performance here, uh, first and foremost, we are talking about COGS, that, which is around 950 million for these six products. And uh, we are talking about a sales value of around uh, a bit more than 1 billion. Now, what makes this uh, portion or this step of the implementation an apple-to-apple -apple comparison is that API shows how it can meet the demand at its entirety. So you see here, there is zero uh, lost demand or zero lost sales. Um, so the full, the full demand is being met and there are no lost sales on either, both, uh, either one of the two systems. But on the other hand, API is reducing the inventory by 47%, which results in um, almost doubling turns or um, improving the turns by 88% and reducing inventory days by 46%. Um, and you see here the kind of steady performance of API. Now, um, the blue line here is the actual system, uh, day in, day out, the inventory, as you could tell. And um, the orange line is the inventory of API. And before showing you uh, select products to um, appreciate how API is doing it, let's try to at least understand the logic behind it. Um, if you think of a regular TPOP or time phased order protocol uh, being applied, API is reducing the number of procurements here substantially. You see here, rather than 161 procurements or shipments, API is bringing them to uh, 104, which is a 35% reduction. On the other hand, uh, API is bold or fearless when it comes to determining the, the, um, the right amounts of procurements. Uh, and this is what actually results in even doubling the procurement. So lesser number of procurements with more um, a procurement size. And um, um, if we uh, dig into individual products, Jim, um, this is, for example, a product that's worth 136 millions in COGS and uh, 109 uh, millions in, uh, in sales. And if you could uh, see here that the performance of API is substantial when it comes to reducing the inventory by 65%. Um, and um, it's reducing the number of procurements by 56%. And you see here, this is a typical essential product, Jim, that is um, uh, needed day in, day out for operations. That's why the business users tend to uh, overstock or uh, store more from an inventory standpoint, um, more than what they need, because they are afraid that they are running out of things, which is a very natural human behavior that uh, like anyone that did manage a supply chain would know. On the other hand, if we are looking at another type of a product, and um, this is the largest product from an inventory standpoint, um, 433 millions in, uh, in COGS, inventory value of 43 millions. And you see here that um, um, the blue line is going through um, a uh, sinusoidal effect, right? Um, um, so it's oscillating, which is very normal, the Bullwood effect that we all know. And that's probably because the customers did um, go through a manual decision of reducing the inventory by the end of Q3. Um, and uh, then they started to cripple uh, orders uh, in Q4. And you see here how API, on the other hand, did reduce the number of procurements by 60% while reducing the inventory at the low end here by 20% uh, or 22%. Now, worth mentioning, Jim, that um, this system is also applicable to the same customer on the uh, manufacturing side. And this is where uh, the raw materials kicks in, where, and you see here, it's a different skinning, kind of. It's a different uh, interface where um, you see here the raw materials are uh, um, uh, showing all the actual movements of inventory across the different warehouses, uh, the procurements orders, deliveries, uh, and the inbound outbound inventories. 
and EPA yeah, on wow and you're really uh, uh up in the number of uh uh, items, 22, almost 23,000 yes, items yes, too. Yes, and this is where we are showing another portion of the network, of the very same network, but now we are talking about um, the comprehensive manufacturing angle of, uh, of this same petrochemicals player. And, um, and just like, uh, I wouldn't go through um, the, ex the, the explanation again, but uh, just to show that uh, the flavors would have uh, different look and feel, however, uh, the essence of API would be here to uh, minimizing inventory uh, for every single step across the whole manufacturing step. So um, uh, I hope that this uh, allows us uh, to get some sort of a feel of how uh, the system works in depth. Jim. Yeah, wow, great overview, Mohammed. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I know everyone out there would probably like to be asking questions as we go through that, but I encourage you to, you know, put your questions in the uh, chat box and we can get back to them. But uh, again, thank you very much, Mohammed. That was very impressive. I think now what we want to do is uh, go over to Doug. Doug, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Jim. Okay, great. I think uh, we've given the audience a good appreciation of what the product can do from a functionality standpoint. However, I'm sure they're curious about what value and ROI organizations can expect to see from the use of our products. Can you provide us with some insight into what our customers are seeing? Yeah, absolutely, Jim, uh, and thanks. And uh, Mohammed, thank you, uh, great demo. Um, absolutely amazing, uh, super powerful, so appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so as everyone can see from you know, the demo and the, the, the conversations up to this point, um, you know, what the power of AI and, uh, Silos a SCAS solution uh, platform uh, can bring, uh, how it can take uh, global supply chain planning, you know, really to a whole new level that goes, um, I don't even think it's arguably, I, I think that it goes well beyond that of traditional planning systems and human capacity, um, especially, you know, given just the, the massiveness and the complexity of some of these supply chain intensive organizations and manufacturing and distribution and, and retail. So, um, it's definitely uh, and, and quickly, you know, expanding beyond uh, that mark. So let me talk a little bit about what it means. What does it look like uh, once an organization applies um, our uh, technology in their environment? So as you see on the screen, um, you know, you know, first of all, we're dealing with both bottom line, top line improvements, you know, that impact the P&L. Um, the balance sheet, you know, the cash to cash cycle. So some of those things are um, include, you know, you know, how can we reduce our carrying, uh, uh, carrying inventory costs, right? How can we improve and reduce our supply chain management costs? And, um, you know, can we get better at and leverage, you know, cross warehouse, uh, you know, movement, um, expedite, ex expediting products, uh, expirations where applicable, um, et cetera. Um, uh, minimizing stock outs while max, you know, while while maximizing your availability, right? I mean, still meeting your customer demand, your delivery dates, uh, and executing to the strategy of your of your supply chain and your overall business plan. Um, then you have the cash to cash or the balance sheet, right? I mean, nobody wants their you know their capital tied up, right? I mean, there's just way too much going on, and if I've got it all tied up into inventory and it's taking me, you know, you know simply you know, this too long, you know, to turn over and get through the system. Um, you know, my capital is being tied up, you know, I'm sure we all have other projects and initiatives and, you know, things like that, right, that uh, I would need to be working on. So, you know, these numbers you see here, these aren't just something we pulled out and said, hey, let's just go and, you know, show some really cool numbers. Uh, these are real world numbers um, that our customers are seeing that we um, you know, that we go through um, and help our, our customers uh, understand in what we call um, a diagnostics uh, phase, right? So, so we have a whole process um, that allows us to work with the customer. Um, it's a one to three month effort engagement. Um, but out of that, you know, using the real world data, but out of that, um, you know, demonstrates and provides you know, a clear, clean ROI once the system is put in place and being utilized. Um, I mean, so Doug, is it, it, when, when you're talking about that diagnostic phase, is that just kind of uh, coming in and assessing things or, or what is it? What do you do? Yeah, yeah. So, so no, so we are, we are interactively, I mean, it is really, um, it, it's an implementation 
type engagement, right? I mean, it's you haven't bought the software, but in, in order to accurately assess and to provide you a real, um, you know, a real world uh, um, ROI framework and picture and snapshot, um, we are doing basically working with your team, uh, working with our data scientists and our teams, and we're doing an implementation. And at the end of the day, it's about a 70%, you know, um, you know, implementation, if you will, right? And, you know, from there, um, you know, you determine whether or not, you know, how we move forward. But um, if I go back to the, to the last slide, I just want to cover a couple of things. Um, the one area I really want to, so, you know, inventory, we all want an inventory reduction, right? We want to run as lean and mean as we can. Um, you know, that's in everybody's benefit, right? And so I think you could clearly see in the demo you know, how this could, um, you know, help you, especially with the cross supply chain visibility, right? I mean, virtually real time, right? Um, a couple of the other key areas, right? I mean, I want to supply chain costs for a minute. Um, you know, think about it, right? That's one of the, you know, it, it represents a, consider, a considerable um, percentage of, you know, the, the sale price of the good or service. Um, and any savings you do here and can make here is going to flow directly to the bottom line. Right. So this is one of the areas where you can actually um, uh, increase profits. Right. Without increasing sales. Right. And I'll give you this a quick example. Right. So, you know, if you had a, a sales of, of 5 percent or net profit of 5 percent, for example, and you had a just a supply chain reduct, a cost reduction from nine to four percent or, you know, 12 to seven or, you know, pick a number. Right. You'll double your you'll double your net profits right there right so it's super super important this is a, a key key area right that um you know through automation through uh, streamlining processes through empowering your planners and executives to make better decisions more quickly more accurately um, will certainly drive that um from this phase um i want to take you to a real world uh, summary of uh um, an eight, let's, so this is real, but you're gonna, you know, customers not being shown here, obviously. So for example, a $800 million company, right? So um, you take the, this has come directly from your balance sheet or me having a conversation with you, right? To help you build this up front or what we pull out of our diagnostic stage, right? So in this case, I mean, you can see, so on my sheet earlier, you saw, inventory reductions of 20 to 40 percent. In this case, you know, we were very comfortable and, and saw very consistent results, you know, in the 20 percent, um, you know, neighborhood, right? You know, stockhouse, right? That's another huge, you know, area that, you know, can make or break you quite honestly, right? So, um, uh, and then the supply chain costs, right? So, uh, another big, you know, 15, you know, 15 percent, you know, savings on supply chain costs. If you look at my previous example I gave, that's huge. I mean, it's game changing, uh, absolutely game changing. So if you look down at the bottom, um, where we do our summary, you know, if you just look at the um, at the uh, highlighted bottom line total annual cost savings, right, of ten million dollars, right above it, you'll see the four or five uh, areas in the bottom line. You know, you know, uh, impacting the carrying costs, the expiration costs, right. So what we were able to do, and keep in mind. This is us coming in with your supply chain current state. That means current systems in place. I don't care what, um, if you have custom supply chain planning solutions, if you have name brand supply chain solutions and whatever systems you have, we are coming in and saying over and above that, anything you have today, no matter how advanced you, know, you think your advanced planning systems are, we are gonna take you to another $10 million savings. Okay, so we're taking current situation, current state of your supply chain based on everything. So basically I would look at, I would look at you and say, you know, this is you know, where you are before we show this is as good as it gets, right, for you. So by us coming in, we can shave off and take you to a whole new level, right? Um, the supply spin, you know, down at the bottom, I just wanna make this, you know, one comment, you can read the, cap, the, the, the cash cycle on the top line, right? Um, reducing the amount of days in inventory, you know, by 15. I mean, that's a huge impact. But this first, this first year only, as you see, um, huge, 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 massive impact. 
And what I will say here is as long as this SCAS and API is in place, um, you know, that will continue to be, you know, what you gain from that. You know, if you were to unplug it, for example, and we have this conversation all the time, you'll go back to status quo just like you were, um, you know, before we even came into the picture. Great so, overview, Doug. Yeah, so um, so that's just a, an overview. So, you know, one of the things I think all businesses, you know, that we can all agree on that is that um, when, you, when you look at a solution like this, right, um, you know, We've done a lot. We continue to do a lot, but you know it takes a partner uh, ecosystem, right? And I don't care what business you're in. Partnerships are critical. I mean, I would say even in traditional businesses, customers are your partners, right? So we all need them, right? To and 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 they're extremely beneficial in in a, in a multitude of ways, right? Well, that's no different for Sealux. So um, we have invested, as have our partners, have invested significantly and building out and developing a, a global um, ecosystem, which is part of our partner AIM program. And the AIM is AI Matters. Um, some of the companies that you'll see here, right? So, so not only from a global perspective, but also a country region perspective, right? So, I mean, you can look from our, our, our global um, kind of uh, approach and go to market. You know, you see SAP up there, you see Accenture, you see Capgemini um, from the uh, Middle East and uh, Africa, um, you know, part of the region. I mean, you, know, you see, you know, Evo Labs and ATS and AEC, uh, and then of course, you know, in the in the U.S. Right? Um, not only do we have uh, a couple there with Sigma and Micro Excel, but then again, SAP, Accenture, and Capgemini um, over uh, um, supporting that as well. Um, so, so one of the things that I wanted to do and that we wanted to do is uh, uh, feature and bring in one of our uh, global partners. They're based here in the U.S. Um, I say global partners because they are extremely U.S. focused, but they also have a very large Middle East or significant Middle Eastern uh, operation as well. Um, and uh, with us, as he was introduced at the beginning, is uh, Gordon Foles. He's the vice president of sales. Uh, for Micro Excel. Uh, we're super excited about this uh, partnership. Um, we're just getting it uh, undergoing and, um, you know, couldn't be more excited. So I want to take an opportunity to introduce you to Gordon. And Gordon, you know what, I want to give you an opportunity just real quick to share with the audience, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about, um, uh, you know, Micro Excel and uh, what you guys are all about. Yeah, Doug, thanks so much. I appreciate it. This was uh really a great webinar and I and I appreciate the attendees that uh, are listening in. Well, MicroExcel has been around for almost 20 years. Uh, in 2021, we will be uh, celebrating our 20th year in operation and we're a global systems integrator that focuses around SAP and Microsoft, but our SAP practice uh, is focused on that mid-sized products company and we deliver an end-to-end -end SAP transformation and migration services for these clients. So that's, in a nutshell, that's kind of what we do. That's and great, Gordon. Yeah, thanks for that, man. Appreciate that. Um, so share a little bit about, um, you know, as we were going down the journey of, um, you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, getting our game plan in action, uh, what kind of excited you um, about, you know, silos and, you know, uh, you know, why silos as a, a key focus for micro Excel as you continue to you know, grow your business? Thanks, Doug. Yeah, our objective is we try to help our clients increase the value and compliance uh, through a couple of different ways. We'll, and that is primarily around change management, our focus around automation, analytics, and then we have a managed service cap capability. And we do that on with a global delivery and partner model. Uh, but what we were seeing with CELOS is our focus, like I said, is around product companies, consumer product companies, industrial products, high tech, and life science industry. And almost without exception, they all struggle with forecasting, inventory control, and then the corresponding CFO wants to optimize their working capital. So 
as we are experiencing just an unprecedented year of supply chain disruption, all of these companies are struggling with a whole new set of rules. And how can they, uh, all the rules that they've done for the last 10, 15 years, every company, I don't care who they are, does some type of capacity and supply chain planning, whether it's on the back of a napkin, on an Excel spreadsheet, or they use some sophisticated system. And now all of those models don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other mitigating factors. And when, when you guys came to us and told us what you had available here, I said, oh my goodness, this is a game changer. How can you take these thousands of various different variables and wrap them around an artificial intelligence and that fits right into our automation and analytics capabilities. And we've seen over and over again that these types of initiatives uh, take on a life of themselves. They're, they're hard, they're arduous, they're complex, and it requires a great deal of change management. So with CELOS, we saw a capability to be able to bring that to bear quickly and mitigate the risk and the complexity because of the artificial intelligence component. Because I'll give you an example. You know, I spent a third of my career in manufacturing. And when we had an issue uh, and we had a customer or a big order that came in, that inventory control manager could walk out on the on, into the warehouse or onto the shop floor, the production scheduling guy, and actually see what's going on. Well, with COVID, that's all changed. Those guys are now working from home or they're working from a remote location. So what CLS does is it gives accuracy and dependability that the system is making the right choices for you. And that was a game changer for you. And we're just can't be more excited about what this is gonna do for our clients. That's great, Gordon. Thanks, thanks for that. You know, real quick as we're wrapping up, and I, I know you hit on COVID, um, you know, maybe spend a couple minutes here. Uh, so, you know, this is something that has impacted us all. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a provider, a consumer, a individual, um, small business. It, it's, it's, it, it's impacted our work. It's impacted everything. Um, how do you see things like COVID? You know, we've had some conversations around this, right? Um, you know, helping your customers, right? You know, uh, allowing you to bring, you know, untapped value that uh, uh, without something like this, um, you know, with a comprehensive combined, you know, solution with Microcell and, and Silos um, would be impossible. So can you talk just real quickly about that? Yes. Uh, one of our focuses around life science and pharmaceutical companies. And uh, when COVID hit, at the beginning of the year, uh, we those industries finally realized it was a wake up call for them. And they finally realized that some of these uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, those base ingredients that they use to either compound or put into finished product had been outsourced for the last 15 or 20 years to uh, offshore suppliers and they were not able to get those products in into the US to make the various products to supply their healthcare uh, recipients. And, and so what these companies said is we got to bring this back in house. So these APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturers started bringing these things in house. Well, they still struggled with this disruption and all the different variables that go along with it, because throughout the course of 2020, there was these hot spots where they still couldn't get product in, they couldn't get things produced. And so what uh, we're seeing with the advent of the capabilities that CELUS provides is being able to, like you said, Doug, real time, develop a, uh, a scenario, a response to the critical nature of that supply chain that uh, no one person can, 
keep all that in their head. And uh, this is just uh, just going to benefit the, the uh, pharma and life science industry significantly as we move forward. And this whole industry re reinvents themselves because of the market conditions that they're affected by. That's awesome, Gordon. I, I really appreciate that. That's a great overview and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah, so Jim, Gordon. I'm going to uh, pass it back to you. Yeah, I don't think yeah. we're... Really appreciate it, Gordon. That was, that was great insight and some uh, real world sort of uh, scenarios in terms of what you've seen uh, out in uh, with your customers. Um, so we do have time for a couple of questions here. I know we're getting to the end there and I appreciate everyone hanging in. Um, and some of the questions, as we mentioned earlier, that we're not gonna be able to get to, we will uh, send out a um, follow up to this and provide uh, a response to those questions. But one that we do have here is, uh, maybe direct this to, to Mohammed. Um, how does SCAS R help optimize inventory, reduce stockouts, and manage de uh, demands? Well, if you think about it, Jim, um, the whole core of uh, the underlying AI engine for SCAS is uh, about uh, playing with the supply chain one move at a time, as we did discuss. And um, um, the result of that is that we are autonomously um, generating the right replenishment orders, at the right timing and so on. But uh, if you even dig deeper in the core of uh, the optimization, the optimization here is uh, uh, kind of straightforward. We are trying to uh, minimize stockouts while meeting the demand. So this is, uh, I know that the supply chain experts and um, operators are usually having their minds around equations and usually having their minds around optimization goals. So think of, AI taking that as a goal, which is minimizing stockouts and optimizing availability while minimizing inventory. And uh, the ability of like optimizing against all of these goals concurrently is what allows API to be the perfect solution for uh, autonomously uh, running the replenishment and autonomously running the uh, procurement and inventory processes while achieving the most superior performance when it comes to uh, the financial side of things, when it comes to the ROI uh, side of things. Yep, absolutely. Definitely a, a change in, uh, you know, what the, the paradigm is that we've seen before with planning systems. And kind of a follow-up to that is, how does automation alerts create supply chain plan and automate procurement processes, including uh, approvals? Well, if you think about it, uh, what we are um, allowing the users to do here is take the back seat while still uh, being in the driver's seat. And that may seem kind of surprising as to how we are doing it. Um, we are um, running seamlessly on top of the ARPs and then we are um, like any other MRP engine, the ARP would uh, generate planned orders that may be uh, run for, um, uh, for approvals by the users or may uh, eventually be, be seamlessly pushed as firm planned orders. So in other words, the user does have the ability at any point in time to uh, determine that for this subset of products or for these subset of cases, uh, I need to approve whatever you guys or like whatever this engine is generating first. Hence. Um, the operator continues to be in the driver's seat. However, they don't need to run um, the heavy lifting, um, like when it comes to forecasting and uh, inventory management um, and planning uh, constraints and planning parameters and so on. So kind of achieving the good of the two worlds, if you think, if you think about it, Jim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kind of, you know, we've talked about before is uh, it's like the self-driving car. We, we know it's coming and, and probably when you get one of those self-driving cars, you're going to get in it, but you're still not maybe going to get in the back seat. You're still going to be able to grab the steering wheel. And then after you've been in it for six months and have never touched the steering wheel, you may get in the back seat and watch a movie or, or uh, do some work. So I appreciate it. Well, a great day for, from uh, everybody. I, I really appreciate your part participation, Mohammed, Doug, uh, Gordon, great input. Um, and so uh, I wanna wrap up and I hope you found today's presentations informative, enlightening, and that you saw how CELO supply chain suite is delivering on this third generation of autonomous supply chain planning. 
Um, so uh, just uh, wanted to kind of highlight here uh, that we, uh, following this presentation, everyone that uh, participated in the webinar will be sending out uh, a copy of this presentation along with the recording and those follow-up questions. And in the presentation, you'll see you know, the local regions where you can contact us and uh, we would welcome the opportunity to talk to you about your specific requirements and how CELOs might be able to address those. So again, I wanted to thank everyone for today's uh, uh, attention and participation in the event. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day and a great holiday. Thank you very much.